Did you know the song Country Roads by John Denver is in fact about Western Virginia and not West Virginia? I feel like John could have made better decisions lyrically. I'm Aiden Mattis and welcome back to The War Lodge. In that country classic, John Denver does have a lyric, life is old here, older than the trees. And he's not kidding. The Appalachian mountain range is in fact older than the trees. At 480 million years old, it is not just older than the 370 million year old trees or the 445 million year old horseshoe crabs, but even older than the 450 million year old species of sharks. It is in fact one of the oldest things on the planet. And that mountain range is home to a lot of people and a lot of folklore. Now, throughout this video, I am going to be talking about the Appalachian Mountain Range, or the Appalachian Mountain Range. No matter which way I say it, some of you are going to get upset with me. But I'm going to be sticking with Appalachia, because last time I said Appalachia, Wendigoon told me I sound like a fed, and I don't like that. Conservatively, the Appalachian region covers over a thousand miles from western Mississippi all the way up to southern New York, and has a square mileage of about 206,000. For our European viewers who might not quite understand the scale of the United States, that's like driving from Warsaw to Paris, and that's about twice the size of Italy. It also includes five different biomes, but the United States as a whole contains literally all of them. But today, Appalachia is inhabited by about 25 million people of various backgrounds, most of which do come from underprivileged or underserved ethnic communities. For example, there are Native Americans who have stuck around all this time, avoiding the massive movements out of the eastern region of the 1800s. There's also the descendants of both free and enslaved blacks who were placed in the region. And later, there came waves of Celtic migrants, for example, Irish, Scottish, and Welsh miners, as well as a number of Italian waves and some Eastern European waves of immigrants. And the result is a very vibrant and extremely unique culture. And that culture is a big topic of conversation on the internet, partially because people have taken little snippets of Appalachian folklore and turned them into very fictionalized versions of the more traditional tales, to put it nicely. But a lot of this folklore comes from basically a menagerie of African folklore, Native American, Celtic, Eastern European, and even Italian. So you've got all sorts of crazy stuff that stuck around, like the idea of sin eaters, for example, from Celtic folklore. Due to the Native American presence, we hear a lot about Bigfoot or Sasquatch. There's also the Mothman of West Virginia, and of course we have the Bell Witch of Tennessee. By the way, we have videos on all three of those things. You should go check them out. One thing that we don't have a video on, but that I wanted to address is of course the Flatwoods Monster, which is believed to be something of a UFO encounter. I'll quickly tell you that story. In September of 1952, Ed and Fred May were out with one of their buddies, Tommy Heyer, when they saw something fall out of the sky and crash into the lands of a farmer named Bailey Fisher. They ran home and told their mother, Kathleen May. Now Kathleen, seeking to create the best posse possible, riled up two other kids, Neil Nunley and Robbie Shaver, and then thought, you know what, we should probably go get our neighbor who's in the National Guard. So after conscripting Eugene Lemon, he grabbed a flashlight, they all grabbed some materials, and they headed off for the crash site. And when they got there, what they discovered was rather unsettling. They looked over into what was something of a crater and discovered a set of pulsing red eyes, and Eugene claimed to see a little bit more than just that. He claimed that surrounding the pulsing red eyes was a round head with something of a pointed hood. One of the maze also claimed that it had a pungent odor that made them somewhat nauseous. And as Eugene shined his flashlight at it, he saw it move, and this spooked all of them, and they immediately ran away. And of course, there's the classic Appalachian proverb, if you hear someone calling your name in the woods, no, you didn't. But who might be calling your name in the woods? Well, there's anyone's guess. It could be any number of things. A lot of people suggest witchcraft, aliens, even Bigfoot. But one slightly more mundane possibility is feral people. Now, many people have heard stories of encounters with feral people living out in the mountains of places like Appalachia, but rarely are these accounts well documented or even verified. Also, a lot of people seem to play into a stereotype about the Appalachian region that everyone there is some inbred, stupid, backcountry hillbilly, and that's not at all the case. Most people in this region are simply living their lives in a culture that differs from that that most people are accustomed to. 
you know, urbanites aren't going to understand what it's like to go out in the woods and, and live that lifestyle. So in many cases, these stories of communities of inbred feral people, like what you see in, for example, the Wrong Turn movies, have been greatly exaggerated and are not reflective of actual Appalachian culture or actual Appalachian people. But every now and then, there is a story that makes you go, hmm. And these stories are almost exclusively about individuals out in the woods, not, you know, communities, not families, like one or two wild men, so to speak, who are living out in the bush. And there's two accounts that come to mind. One is the March 5th, 1871 Hagerstown Mail article, wherein residents were warned of a wild man who was about seven feet tall, had very large red eyes, and was trying to abduct women. Now, I could not find an actual newspaper clipping to verify this, but the very reputable BigfootEncounters.com did tell me that it was there. So I'm not going to rely too heavily on that. What I will rely a little bit more heavily on is the anecdote of a man named Rob Phillips. Now, around the year 1995, Rob Phillips and his cousin Randy Sparks were off on a hike. They were headed through the forest to Watauga Cliffs, Tennessee, and along the way, it started raining. That wasn't too big of an issue. They were having a nice time. The trees were giving them some cover. But a little bit into the trip, they discovered that it was really quiet. Not like a little quiet, not, you know, occasional bird chirping quiet. Like no sound outside of the rain and their footsteps quiet. Until there was another sound, the sound of twigs snapping. And after the twigs snapped, they heard something more unsettling than simple brush movement. They heard a scream that Rob describes as neither human nor animal sounding. As one is wont to do when they hear a inhuman scream out in the wilderness, Rob and Randy just ran. They just booked it. And in the darkness, which according to the story, it's a little difficult to tell if this was nighttime. It doesn't really make sense it was nighttime. It more makes sense that it was just cloudy and all of that. But either way, Randy says that in the dark, or Rob says that in the dark, he and Randy got separated. And he was just hiding himself up against a tree, trying not to move, hoping that whatever was out there went away. Of course, it didn't. He heard some more twigs snapping all around him. And then he claims that up in a tree, about 20 feet up and about 15 feet away from him, which is actually really close, like on the ground, 20 feet up is high. 15 feet from you, not very far. That's like the width of most rooms. He claims that in the tree, he saw a large being with glowing beady red eyes, long arms, and sharp claws. Now, I do question if it was dark enough to lose your cousin, how was it not dark enough to obscure this figure? But I, I you know, I don't, have I don't have Rob or Randy here to ask, so I'm just going with what they said. They eventually did make it back to their car and speaking to various news publications in 2015, he kept this story under wraps for 20 years, in 2015, Rob said that it was a stout creature with uh, charcoal gray fur that was neither shaggy nor fine, and that it was about nine feet tall, which does pretty well match the description of the one mentioned in the newspaper article from 1871. But Aiden, this is, this is a missing 401 video. Why, why are you telling me all of this, you might be asking? Well, it is possible for a small number, maybe three to five, of feral people to exist out in the woods. That is a possibility. Now, could that be due to being cut off from society, being some sort of, uh, you know, mental illness that they just shoved you off into the woods? There's any number of reasons why someone could end up living a life that far off the grid and that far from what we consider to be humanity. And of course, say there was a family that got lost out in the woods at some point. Three generations of sibling to sibling inbreeding can create situations where you've got major physical deformities, lack of intelligence, loss of language, violent behavior, any number of things. But of course, this is extremely rare. This is not a norm. The average Appalachian family is not a bunch of inbred lunatics. But my point here is not even in to, to like really lean on wild men here. The point is, if it's possible for a small number of people to survive out in the wilderness with no technology whatsoever or very limited rudimentary technology, it's very easily possible for a group of adult men in 1989 to go out in the woods for an extended period of time and perhaps chase a woman down, which might be what happened to Eloise Lindsay. 
You see, after graduating from Agnes Scott College in 1989, May of 1989, Eloise Lindsay didn't know what to do with her life, which I very much resonate with as a 24 year old. I get that. So she decided, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go hike some of the Appalachian Trail, the Appalachian Trail, the trail of the mountains that are south of where I currently live. I don't know how to say this to make you people happy. So she planned a 43 mile hike along the Georgia Carolina border. So Eloise, not wanting to just sit around on her butt until she figured out what she was gonna do, decided to plan this 43 mile hike. Now she was gonna do the hike solo for the first bit and then meet up with somebody on November 12th. So when she arrived at the Foothills Trail in Table Rock State Park on November 4th, she put down the book Eloise and George Lindsay. Now there was of course no George Lindsay with her, but she didn't wanna to advertise to people behind her that she was in fact alone on the trail, which is very smart. And Eloise is described in every contemporaneous news article as being an experienced hiker. So she knew what she was doing. She had been out on the trails. She had been backpacking. This was not a new trip to her. So it was very shocking to everyone when on November 12th, Eloise did not appear at the rendezvous point. So realizing something must be wrong here, they contacted authorities and this included both park authorities uh, and local sheriff's departments. The sheriff's department launched a seven day search with over a hundred people combing the trail and the nearby areas looking for Eloise. But after seven days, no trace of her had turned up. And as a result, not really knowing what to do, they called off the search. Now, if you've watched a lot of our videos, you might be noticing a lack of, for example, helicopters. Uh, you try seeing into the Appalachian wilderness from a helicopter. It's not gonna work. It's very dense vegetation. So these hundred people, the sheriff's department, local authorities, all of that, after an entire week of searching, failed to find Eloise, but Wayne Hooper didn't. You see, two days after the official search was called off, Wayne, who was just out deer hunting, stumbled across a very delirious, blistered, cut up, bruised, battered, very, uh, you know, just on the edge of death, really, Eloise Lindsay. It was November 20th, 1989, and she spent the night in a nearby hospital before returning to her home and holding a press conference underneath a tree that was, you know, adorned with yellow ribbons because they were so excited they found her. And Eloise proceeded to tell the following story to the press. On November 7th, a few days after she had started her hike, she kept hearing a few men on the trail behind her who had walkie-talkies who were seemingly talking about her. The men mentioned a woman moving quickly up the hill ahead of them on the trail, which, as far as she could tell looking around, could only possibly be her. And at this point, some sort of sixth sense kicked in. Eloise knew, somehow, that whatever these men were doing on the trail, and whatever their intentions were regarding her, they were not good. Eloise described an instinctive urge to get off the trail. But this is where things get weird. Because for the next 12 days, she would wander throughout the Appalachian wilderness, subsisting on dried apples that she took out of her backpack. She left her backpack behind so she could move faster. So she was subsisting on dried apples, berries, anything she could find that was edible out in the wilderness until eventually she did come across a cache of pound cake and donuts. Now, to those of us who are not Appalachian trail hikers, that may seem kind of odd, but trail gifts are kind of a thing that people will leave out along the trail for people who are following them. You know, it's supposed to be good karma, that kind of thing. Now, here's the problem. Eloise was not on the trail. She was in the middle of the woods. Why was there a box of donuts and pound cake hanging from a tree in the middle of the woods? And if you're wondering, why did, El why did Eloise run into the woods that deep? Why didn't she just go off the trail, wait for the men to pass, and then either go back or head further up the trail and seek help? The men chased her. She claims that these men chased her off of the, the trail, that they chased her into the woods, that they kept following her. But the police were completely uninterested in that story. This 22-year-old woman, who had been in the woods for 12 days, hiding in a burned out truck at one point, with infected blisters all over her feet, in pain, malnourished, just really even, like really on the brink of just dying. When Wayne Hooper found her, she comes back and she tells this story of how she was chased through the woods for 12 days. And that even when she kind of figured rescuers were out there, when she heard the sound of helicopters overhead, now, of course, like I said, the helicopters didn't find anything because how would they? It's really dense forest. But 
when she heard the sound of helicopters overhead, she decided not to light a fire because she was sure that she was still being hunted and that the people hunting her would get to her before rescue did. So she decided to lay low and just hope for the best. Now the best was the deer hunter Wayne Hooper, but what really strikes me about this story is how desperate her situation was and yet she still refused to come out. The sheriff for the county even said that he he figured, you know, if she had wanted, he said if she had wanted to be found at any point, she could have walked out of the woods. She kept choosing not to. Why? There is not a good reason. Everything is basically, oh, she was just paranoid. Oh, she was just imagining things. She was just scared, blah, 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 blah. Now, I'm, I'm not typically one who, you know, brands himself as any kind of uh, warrior for the social justice movement or anything that's not really my scene, but uh, this really does feel like they're just being dismissive because she's a woman and they're like, uh -huh, you women, you you don't know what you're talking about. You're You're scared of shadows. In reality, Eloise seems to have been being chased for 12 days by unidentified men who just casually happen to be out in the wilderness. Now, there, there are a few reasons I can think of, some of them more conspiratorial than others, why the authorities wouldn't follow up on what is a very obvious lead. None of them are good. The very mundane one is that they didn't want to bother, and this could easily be written off in 1989 as a paranoid woman just trying to seek attention or something like that. But there's other possibilities. For example, maybe she actually was being chased into the woods, but they kind of knew who was doing it, and for whatever reason decided that it was better not to investigate. What does this mean? Could it be a serial killer issue? Could it be a uh, kidnapping ring issue? A trafficking ring? Something along those lines? Possibly. A lot of people who go missing do end up getting trafficked. That's not good. So maybe they were in on it. Maybe they knew what was going on. Or maybe they felt they were in over their heads and she was back home safe. And it was just better to let that rest. It's hard to tell. But one thing that is questionable is who were these people that chased her off the trail? Well, some documents say that she suggested they were hunters. Others say she suggested they were construction workers. The police say hunters, and then at one point the police do mention construction workers. So it seems like the police were basically trying to feed a story that was plausible to the media. But did construction workers really chase her into the woods for 12 days? That doesn't make any sense. So... What were, what were the police saying? Oh, well, she was just paranoid that she was still being chased. I don't buy that. I don't buy that somebody runs off into the woods. Somebody who is otherwise perfectly mentally healthy, in good physical condition, has their entire life ahead of them. I don't see how that person just runs off into the woods for no reason. I do not see that explanation. Now, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that this is the most mysterious case that we've ever come across or covered. What sticks out to me is the sheer lack of interest from law enforcement in uncovering what happened. Were they embarrassed? Did they think that it was better to not try because if they failed, it would be awkward? I don't, I don't know. But it really seems like something was chasing Eloise. And let's say that the, the people who did chase her off the trail were not the people chasing her into the forest. Because let's be realistic. A couple of construction workers, they're not going to just ditch their entire job to go chase a woman around the woods for 12 days. Hunter, why not just shoot her? Like, if you're trying to kill somebody, it seems like the, the that's the way to go. Unless your uh, intentions are worse than just shooting somebody. But still, I feel like a couple of trained hunters could pretty easily catch up to a 22-year-old woman running around the woods with no rations whatsoever. That just seems unlikely to me that hunters would be unable to do that. So what does that leave? Well, there's a lot of stories about Appalachian wild men. A lot of tales of people being stalked by something in the woods that they don't understand. I'm gonna say this, I think that the cops are probably right, that whatever chased Eloise off the trail is not what chased Eloise through the forest. But I'm also gonna lay a ton of blame squarely on law enforcement here for utterly refusing to follow up and trying to gaslight this woman into believing that nothing happened to her. I mean, the police basically came out and said, yeah, we, we don't think she was chased. You're telling me that a woman caused severe physical harm to herself for, for what? Attention? Because she was paranoid? For 12 days? A 12-day paranoid episode in somebody with no history of mental health issues? Whatsoever? I don't buy that. So, 
Is Eloise Lindsay's case the most mysterious? No. Is it even one that can absolutely be chalked up to something paranormal? No. Is it entirely possible that she was being tracked through the woods by traffickers? Yes. What's the moral of this story? The cops need to do their damn jobs. Come on. This is not, this is not a write-off. This is not, oh, she wandered off because she was drunk. This is a woman who clearly was chased through the wilderness by someone or something, and they should have been figuring out what it was. It is ridiculous that they did not pursue this further, and that they just immediately, upon her being found... By the way, just to be clear, these statements from the police where they were like, oh no, I don't believe anyone chased her off the trail, came in 24 hours after Eloise had been recovered. That's not enough time for any sort of legitimate investigation, especially in 1989 when you didn't have the internet. They did not investigate Eloise's case whatsoever, and that, to me, is extremely suspicious. But if you like what we're doing here at the Lore Lodge, you can subscribe to us on Patreon for $1 a month. You can buy our coffee, Mount Pocono Perk, from Tableau Roasting Co. You can also check out our Amazon storefront, which is in the description. And if you're interested in buying Target products, this is a Target product, and it's very comfy. I highly recommend it. You can check out our other work here on our YouTube channel, The Lore Lodge. You can also check me out on Instagram, TikTok, all that at the Aiden Mattis, or follow our producer Aiden Thornbury at Director Aiden on Instagram and TikTok. I think he also has a YouTube channel that he hasn't uploaded to in like eight years. I'm in half the videos. Please don't watch them. Um, <laughs> but that is going to do it for today's episode. Hope you found this as weird as we did. And I hope that you learned a little something about Appalachia, because it's a pretty cool region of the United States, and it's often uh, misrepresented or underappreciated. But that is going to do it for us today. I'm Aiden Mattis. Thanks for stopping by the world.